off and mute and I will do an intro um, and I'm good to go. Hello everybody, welcome to Loop and Learn, the T1D speaker series. And I'm pretty excited today. We have Dr. Elliot Botvinnik from the University of California, Irvine. I'll read this as quickly as I can. He's professor of biomedical engineering, surgery, Beckman Institute, Laser Institute and Medical Clinic, Edwards Life Sciences Center for Advanced Cardiovascular Technology. Very cool guy. Um, and I, I don't want to say that again, but you'll hear it again. So um, I hope you all learn a lot. I hope you put a lot of questions in the chat because Elliot's involved with a tremendous amount of research that would absolutely impact our lives. We're going to go through our regular disclaimer that the Loop app is a do-it-yourself closed loop algorithm. Uh, this presentation is provided to assist you in making your own decisions in consultation with your healthcare professionals regarding your own self-management of diabetes. You take full responsibility for building and running the system, and you do so at your own risk. Please remember that the Loop app is not FDA approved for therapy. And we'll give our little pitch again for the loopandlearn.org website. Um, it's an amazingly rich website and the search functions are really pretty stunning and they get better every day. So if you can bookmark it, um, you can always go there. Please do sign up for the newsletter, which is getting active again. Um, lots of stuff going on with iOS updates. And so I wanna take a moment just to thank the amazing <laughs> Loop and Learn and Loop Follow admins for their intense work, absolutely intense work, to warn us about the iOS updates and to save those of us who fell through anyway. Um, huge effort, amazing, wonderful human beings. And you, you can't even imagine the number of hours put in around the clock and, and they're still up and functioning. Absolutely amazing. Uh, just some upcoming events. Um, they'll be in the newsletters. Uh, in a little over a week, we have a program about gastric and digestive issues and type one diabetes with Dr. Marina Bassina and Dr. Lynn Nguyen from Stanford University and School of Medicine. Um, the studies have shown that before or within six months of a diagnosis of type one diabetes, our gut biome changes. They see changes in the bacteria. It's involved, it's, it's impactful. Um, and I think we really need to know what it is, uh, whether we're affected by it but, or not. Um, many of us don't even know what it is. So um, I think that'll be interesting and tune in. It's on Monday, October 18th. Uh, then coming up is Diabetes Research Connection with Dr. C.C. King. Um, they do a lot of research, um, basic early research uh, with, with smaller grants. Um, and he talked to us once and he said he was talking about different types of diabetes and we perked up saying, really, tell us about that. So he's gonna come talk about the different types of diabetes, how they overlap um, and some of the other research they're working on. And then we're pushing it to November. Uh, we have Anton Beckman and Elsie De Rosa. Um, Anton is the founder of Bublan. Um, it works with Diabox and um, Abbott Libre. And he also has a, an eyelet cell transplant. So they're working on a really amazing presentation. I don't think we'll get it done in an hour, but they have a lot to say and it'll be really interesting. And then today, because we are a DIY community and um, I really wanna share with the people that are involved in this community, we have two co-moderators when we get to the Q&A and I think this is just a lot of fun. So we have, we have Henrik Carlson, um, he's the father of uh, two adorable kids. His 11-year-old daughter was diagnosed with T1D a little over a year ago. His nine-year-old son has two autoantibodies and is at risk in the risk group for developing T1D. Um, his daughter is looping with Dexcom, Omnipod, and Fiasp. And the whole family, God bless them, how wonderful. They're all low-carb eaters. They're all supportive of the situation. He is VP and Distinguished Engineer at Electronic Arts in Vancouver, Canada. I thought he was still in Sweden, so I don't feel so bad that he's up at this time. And he's a strong believer in science. That was fun to read. Um, Rebecca Jervy is one of the admins of Loop and Learn. She is a type 1 diabetic. She uses Android APS. She doesn't much like Apple. 
Um, she's really smart. She does a lot of work with, with STEM and has a degree in physics. And she too is a strong believer in science, I guess a lot of us are. So now to the main event. Um, Dr. Elliot Botvinnik, as I said, I'm not gonna go through what he is. Okay, he's professor of a lot of things. Um, he's also uh, working on a project uh, called iGlobe. It was awarded a three-year, $3.5 million grant, along with Dr. Greg, Gregory Weiss, um, professor of chemistry, who actually did an experiment to unboil an egg, but that's another whole story. Um, so the grant came from the Helmsley Charitable Trust, and it is a first of its kind device to simultaneously measure insulin, glucose, oxygen, and ketones with a single probe inserted underneath the skin. That's really cool. Um, he was named the UCI Samuel A. School of Engineering Innovator of the Year and Entrepreneurial Leader of the Year for several years running, and he holds more than 10 patents. I'm sure that information is old. Um, he got all his graduate and postgraduate education at the University of California, San Diego. This is my fun part. He is a dynamic, a very enthusiastic scientist. And I'm just so honored to call Elliot an amazing friend to me and the entire T1D community. In a comment with him yesterday, he said, you know, you T1Ds are a tough crowd. Um, so um, show him how tough you are, you know, put your questions in. He can handle it, trust me, I know. Um, and I think you will absolutely enjoy this today and learn a lot. So I'm just gonna turn it over to Elliot now. Live up to the uh, intro. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for being here. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, I also value uh, your friendship. Not so much Richard, but he, I really value your friendship. <laughs> I'm assuming he's <laughs> back there somewhere. Um, yeah, let me start my slideshow. And for the record, when I said you, you're you're tough, it's from the perspective of a clinician, you know. So be nice to me. Um, so can you see my main screen, or do you see that weird view? Let me see, we see it. We okay, it. perfect. All right. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, my name is Elliot. Our cardiovascular center just changed names to something that. The acronym is better, it's CIRC. It used to be LCACT, which was hard to say. So we bought an amazing new director and now we are the Edwards Life Sciences Foundation Cardiovascular Innovation and Research Center, which is just a big mouthful, but it's run by an incredible human being. So I wanna to talk to you about iGlobe, which, and Joanne, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it stands for insulin, glucose, lactate, oxygen, beta hydroxybutyrate, which is the ketone body that you all are concerned about. Sensor, um, our program officer at the Helmsley Trust calls it Loki. So I'll let you work out that acronym yourself. I thought I'd start by telling you who does all the work because it's very important to me. We have a project we call Life Strip, which is kind of the skeleton of iGlobe. Uh, John Widling, he's a senior scientist in my group. We are partners in crime on all of these projects. Samer Shrame is a postdoc in the lab. He also is the CEO of a spin-out company from the group uh, related to inner ear di diagnostics, or middle ear, excuse me. Dr. Uh, Mark Keating is a postdoc in the lab, just brilliant, da Vinci type person. Sean White, who has since left our lab, was uh, also a postdoc. In the bottom row, uh, Dr. Avid Najdamadi, who was in the group, was instrumental to what I'm going to show you. He's now a senior medical device engineer at Dexcom. Tony Wilkinson is a PhD student in the group. She's working on the ketone sensing. And Dat Nguyen and Michael Lawrence uh, worked on the pH. I'm going to spend a little bit of time showing you the pH sensing that we just got to work. Dat received his PhD a few weeks ago, and he's now about to work at a company that starts with, it, with an M. And Micah just graduated and is gonna get his PhD at Stanford. Okay. So that's our team. And we also added Monica Lyons and Katie Trimble over the summer. I do wanna note, I met them both last year in my hands-on course when they were sophomores during COVID. So I hadn't actually met them until they you know, came, I guess, in the summer. They're amazing, just amazing. This, generation of kids are super smart. And the other part of the team is Professor Gregory Weiss, my good friend and collaborator, and his team, 
which includes PhD students Tia, we call her Tia, Nedek, and Brian Miller. And then Asa and Kurtna are two just super duper undergrads who are working on the project. There's another project we're working on that I don't think I'll talk about unless you're not exa exhausted of me by the end of this talk. But we have something called FlexFlow in collaboration with Professor Ali Maraz. It's basically an infusion set that's designed so blood vessels grow up into it for a quicker delivery of insulin. Uh, with that team, we have a, a Todd Torson, who is a pretty senior scientist at this point, Luciano, uh, a graduate student, uh, Elise, a graduate student, and these three just incredible undergrads. All right, let's get to it. Uh, I wanted to start by thanking my funding sources. They have been really generous to us. Of course, the Helmsley Trust, the JDRF, and down here, this is the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. They're very interested in our work as related to trauma. And so there's two main technologies related to your lives. And I'm going to talk to you about our monitoring project. And again, if you still have the energy, I can tell you a little bit about insulin infusion project. So let me slow my roll here because I tend to talk quickly. Joanne, let me know if I'm going too slow, too fast, whatever. So the key to iGlobe is something we call life strip. And what it is, it's a patch you wear on top of your skin, as many of you are intimately aware of doing. Then we have a thin fiber right here that goes into the skin, not unlike any of the CGMs you may, you may be wearing now or have a loved one using. We have a quarter here for scale. Now, if you were to zoom in on this very thin fiber, what you would see are a bunch of pads. I've colored them just so you can see them, okay? And what we do is every time we want to measure another analyte, we just add one more pad. And I'm going to show you our journey where we started with lactate. Then we went lactate glucose. Now we have lactate glucose pH. And what we're working on for iGlobe will be lacto lactate glucose oxygen beta hydroxybutyrate insulin and maybe pH. We're not sure if we need that. And so that's the core technology. And I'll show you a bunch of cool stuff about that. So what Greg Weiss's group is doing, and I, there's too much intellectual property we haven't filed yet, so I apologize. I have to be a little bit of vague. I have to be vague for now on this topic. But insulin, at least in its monomeric form, as we're doing, it interacts with this lantern that when the lantern binds insulin, it turns on. So I, I will say that much. And we're integrating that concept onto a new little pad. And then the ketone is the same story. I apologize, I can't show you the details. We just haven't protected ourselves yet. And as many of you know, without a patent, you'll never take it to market and nobody can benefit. Um, anyway, same idea. We have a little light switch we're designing that tells us how much ketone there is. Who cares, right, at the end of the day? Um, this is what we want to deliver to the community. Okay, some kind of a dashboard that gives you the time or whatever information you want on there. You know, a graph and a value of lactate, and I'll show you why that's important for those of you uh, who are mad at me for even insulting you by telling you, so I'll talk about lactate. I will have a graph of your insulin. I have the units are picomolar, but I'm sure we can convert it to units easily enough. And of course your glucose. And then for ketone, as we have it now in our minds, There'll be a number and an arrow, green, yellow, red, with an, uh, indicating are you in the danger zone and is it rising or falling? So this is our vision of how this will be delivered to people who need it. So the first thing I want to do is talk to you a little bit about um, life strip. And here's a nice zoomed in view. I just showed you this picture. And the Air Force has funded us to make this wearable and flexible, which has been a pretty fun exercise, actually, in um, geeking out and uh, electronics. What LifeStrip is, and I just want to show you another view of this, um, is again a series of pads on this little fiber that gets implanted where each one will measure a different analyte. So glucose, oxygen, this is in the tissue, and lactate are fully enabled. We're about to kick off a study that's going to use look at all three of these. We're working our tushes off on getting insulin and ketone to work. That clinical study, and I'll tell you about it later, will be ongoing in two years from right now. 
And uh, carbon dioxide and pH were very close to working as an implant. And then my lab in its future direction is we want to start looking at electrolytes. And we're just so lucky to have a relationship with Greg who's not only helping us with the insulin part, but has improved basically every aspect of what we're doing. I encourage you to meet Greg at some time. And um, anyway, to make a long story short, we can change what's on each implant depending on where it's needed. So we're now gonna spin off a company that's making something targeted essentially to um, trauma and sepsis. So there's a version of this that's gonna be lactate, oxygen, and pH that we're in talks with right now about creating that company. And our heart and soul in every waking moment and probably a lot of sleeping moments are for diabetes. And the way this project began is we had a lactate sensor working and I had shown it to Vincent Crabtree who used to be at JDRF. Uh, I think he's still at Dexcom. And he asked me, well, can you measure glucose and lactate at the same time? And we thought we could, and, but I asked why, you know, uh, why would you want to do that? And this is basically how it was distilled to me, which is imagine a hot summer day and your child with type 1 diabetes is playing soccer. This is a nice 90 degree California day and they come running off the field. Should you administer insulin or feed them oranges? And as I preach to the choir, Parents can be quite surprised at how high the blood sugar is. And a lot of the symptoms. Um, oh, thank you. Oh, thanks, Joanne. Oh, good. Now I can steal him. Um, anyway, <laughs> thanks if you're watching. I'm steal you. So a lot of the symptoms of hyper or hypo have a lot of overlap with exercising in a 90 degree day. And I, this is a, a slide that, that I showed to a public lecture in the stem cell building. But to you, I want to show you the study. Not out, This is not ours. This is the study that Vincent tuned me on to. So forgive the color coding. So participants did two kinds of exercise. One I call uh, spin class or intermittent, intermittent high intensity exercise. And one I call beach cruiser, right? Just moderate exercise. So subjects came in and did a study where they're admitted Oops, and again, the y-axis is change in blood glucose. So on average, they had 11 millimolar blood glucose. And they do exercise under this time. This is time on the x-axis. So here's the duration of exercise. Here's duration of recovery. So when you look at the end of the exercise, the black dots, spin class, okay, and the white dots, beach cruiser, they're still hyperglycemic. Right? When you look at the 90-minute time point, just due to the exercise alone, the beach cruiser group is now normal glycemic, but the spin class could have used some insulin. This is how it was explained to me. So they would love to be able to provide the algorithm information as to the metabolic state of the patient, depending upon you know, the, the exercise level. So one way to try to measure how intense the exercise is, is to look at heart rate. There's a lot of people working on this I can't wait for it to work for a closed loop controller. I don't think it's exactly ready for prime time, but I have a lot of faith in people, or I rather confidence in people working on this. But lactate is a pretty interesting molecule. Okay? When, you, when you become anaerobic, right? when you're asking your body to generate energy so you can do, um, rather to convert energy so you can do work at a rate that's higher than oxygen dependent glycolysis can can deliver right you go into anaerobic glycolysis producing lactic acid or lactate so you can see in time this hump is a lot smaller for the beach cruiser than it is for the spin class so we're asking the question is there information in this type of a lactate curve that will help tell a pump mind you the algorithm is not my expertise it would help tell the pump what it should do should it back off should it bolus should it increase its basal rate? You get the idea. So we want to provide continuous information about lactate and glucose in the body. And then we got put in touch with two people, um, David O'Neill, who's a 
collaborator of ours currently clinically, and Michael Wright Dell, who's also a collaborator of ours. He, uh, Mike wrote this amazing article. Joanne, if you like, I can shoot you the link if you want to disseminate it. It's a consensus piece on how perhaps you should dose depending on your exercise type. And I think what's important as a takeaway is aerobic exercise, you may get a downward trend in your glucose in time. Anaerobic, it goes up, but most people are doing exercise kind of in between. And we want to be able to inform the, the user or an algorithm whether or not they've kind of crossed the line one way or the other. So I'd like to show you how this works. So this is a bit of a weird view. So on the left, ignore this, uh, this here. On the left is a device. It's a rendering of the device with a little thing sticking out of it, okay? Now, when you zoom in, here's the pads, and you can see it emits light, okay? It's emitting photons up towards this detector that's worn on the skin. So this is in the body, shooting up photons. Here's a little light meter. Now, some people have very, very pale skin, like myself, and obviously people are highly pigmented. So visible light is not a really good way to convey information from inside the body to outside of the body except for a fairly narrow band of wavelengths, okay, from kind of the deep red to the near infrared. And we tried, I don't know if the scientists in the call, so I'm, I'll assume there are some, so I, we can geek out for a second. We tried to use the same fluorescent dye, more or less, on every pad with slight spectral shifts in their um, emission and try to unmix them computationally. That's the largest fail in my academic career. So we said, wait a minute, why don't we use the same type of dyes or dyes that over, they have overlapping emission bands on each pad and just turn them on one at a time. It was a simultaneously duh and brilliant idea from one of my postdocs. And that's the key to our invention. We can share wavelengths of light by turning these things on one at a time. So how small is it? This is not even our latest. This is our sensor. This object behind it is a number two pencil lead. So it's currently 330 microns in width, which is basically a third of a millimeter. Okay. For clinical studies, we've invented this insertion system. So the green is the space alien. And what you can see here is a, a flexible circuit, which is how this works, with a bunch of electrical connections. Those electrical connections go through this flex circuit within its middle, and they end on tiny little pads, tiny, tiny little pads onto which we can glue light emitting diodes. So this video is gonna show you, we're gonna insert this in the, into the skin. We pull the pin, we pull out this cylinder, and what happens when I do that is the cylinder pulls out a homemade needle that we use to guide this floppy thing into the skin leaving the floppy noodle behind. Okay, So this works, it's built, We've, we're using it, and then you plug in a recording unit, which is currently wired, but under iGlobe will become wireless. Um, hopefully that makes sense. I'm kind of maybe going too quickly, but we drive this in to the body with a sharp needle. We pull out the sharp needle, we leave behind a big floppy thing, and we start making measurements. Um, this is a video for um, showing you one of these things being made by hand, okay? So this is insane. So those green sheets are what sense glucose, lactate, or oxygen. Let me pause this for a second. Um, this is a flex circuit. Uh, we have three LEDs shown in yellow. I should have explained that, okay. Um, then we have three green sensing pads. And then under a microscope, this is incredibly tiny, by the way, under a microscope and by hand, John deposits glue. He puts down these, these um, objects and he assembles the sensor. This, this design has gone into human subjects. Okay. As you may have noticed, <laughs> it's a little ugly and you can't make 100,000 of these things, right? So we just purchased, and we're so excited about this, a pick and place robot and I'll play it in fast motion, but this thing is a fully automated system for make, for doing that assembly. We received it about two weeks ago, and we're just incredibly excited about automating this process. Um, I want to tell you a little bit 
about how the sensing pads work. Okay. Um, here, this one I'm pointing at, let's say it's the one for lactate. And, and Joanne, I don't know if you want me to be interrupted by questions or wait, so I'll, I'll leave that to the moderator. What this is, this is actually neat. For those of you who have ever worked with plumbing at home, there's something called plumber's tape, and you wrap it around the threads, and then you put your fixture on it. Right? It does a number of things, including making it easy to take it off later. If you were to take that plumber's tape and zoom in, and keep zooming in, and keep zooming in, and keep zooming in, and then turn yourself into an electron microscope, what you would see is this. It looks like a bowl of spaghetti, right? It's a bowl of spaghetti, inside of which are pores. And what we do is we coat every noodle of this bowl of spaghetti with an incredibly thin layer of a dye, a fluorescent dye. Right? So now we have like a, a bowl of pasta where every noodle is green now because it's fluorescent. And then we cram into all the spaces a hydrogel that contains a bunch of stuff. But what I'm comfortable uh, disclosing is it contains the enzyme lactate oxidase. This is highly analogous to, a, to the way your glucose sensors work. It's just a different enzyme. So what happens is this green Pac-Man, let's say, is our enzyme. It's the lactate uh, oxidase. As it's chomping away, right, every time it eats a mole of lactate, it eats a mole of oxygen. And then there's some stuff I don't want to discuss. And I probably shouldn't have shown this at the rear of Pac-Man, but Pac-Man then deposits back a, a half a mole of oxygen. So to make a long story short, if I know how much oxygen is around and I know how much oxygen is left, then I can infer rather accurately how much lactic acid there must have been to cause that reaction. And um, so just as a little cartoon of how this works, is in red is our light emitting diode, which happens to emit red light. It pumps into our plumber's tape membrane, and then it gives off invisible light. And that invisible light will pass through pigmented skin onto our detector. Okay. Oops. So let me go back a slide. So that's, what's, that's what is occurring right here. Okay. So then, um, I guess I showed you this already. So we make our films, we put them on top of our tiny, tiny sensor, we assemble this insertion system, we do an exercise study. So we've done this internationally, we're doing it in an ultra clean room, and I'm just so proud of my team for being able to produce this. This is actually, in my opinion, a pretty big accomplishment, which I, I don't say that to be um, conceited, I can say it because I didn't do anything, it's just my team. Um, Okay, so we've taken this to the clinic at UCI, which I didn't show a map of, um, and, um, oh, yeah, Joanne, let me get back to that one, please. Uh, the answer is no, but we're about to. So this study was, this is all pre-COVID. So we've done two websites, uh, two sites, uh, clinical sites in Australia, one at Melbourne with David O'Neill, uh, one in Newcastle. And then we've worked with Mike Rydell in Toronto and right here at, at UC Irvine. This is for the lactate sensor. It's working pretty well. Um, this version of it was inserted with an 18 gauge needle. So this is when you give blood, it's the same kind of system. Uh, each red dot is a blood draw uh, analyzed by a clinical instrument. The height of each little tower is how how difficult the pedaling is for the subject. Okay, they're on a stationary bike. And these little columns correspond to the right axis. These fancy bicycles, you tell it, hey, I want you to provide 200 watts. And what that means is if they slow down, it becomes harder to pedal. If they speed up, it becomes easier to pedal. And, it, and they're always outputting um, 200 watts into the machine. It worked really well. There was a bit of a delay at the peak. Uh, we think it's because we basically used a turkey flavor injector to, to install this sensor. This is old data. Um, more recently, we did a study here that I really want to show you. This is an important slide, I, I think. So this subject has type 1 diabetes and is incredibly fit. They're, I would call them an elite athlete. 
and they're on the bicycle pedaling pretty hard actually and then under these purple bars is a two or three minute sprint as hard i mean really pushing them and what you can see is after this first sprint right you can see lactic acid building up and then when they're done sprinting the body is clearing lactic acid rather quickly right? and then this person did a second bout and now their body is producing lactate faster than their body can clear lactate and begins to rise. They did a third bout and it really rises up and the subject said they weren't feeling well, but these athletes are nuts and they wanted to do one more, boom, the body clears it. The reason why I spend so much detail on this plot is I want you to consider that we are going to algorithmically analyze these kinds of signals and see if they're predictive of blood glucose you know several hours when after the exercise is over and that's kind of the overarching goal of this project and what you can see down below are just some uh, typical data waveforms uh, that we're getting from an international study we've done 41 subjects so far it's working pretty well you can see our sensor can actually pick up on the intermittent bouts of exercise that the blood cannot and we're pretty excited about this um maybe joanne was alluding to this we have been funded for a while now to do a following the following study which is subjects come in on four visits okay? visit one they pedal as hard as they can and the exercise physiologist learns their their physiology basically then in a, in a random order they'll come and do a beach cruiser study an all-out intense study in spin class and we're going to collect data before the exercise during the exercise and after. This data is lactate and glucose with our sensor. We also have intermittent blood draws and the participants all wear Dexcom C CGMs. And then we're gonna analyze the data and ask the question whether or not we can, the lactate dynamics in red can predict glucose dynamics in blue. And I think as Joanne's chat was alluding to, COVID, COVID shut us down. It shut us down for quite a while, and then the person here who could do the study left UCI, and we, we, we didn't, I'm going to say panic. We, we were panicking a little bit. So Michael Rydell and I have decided to try to move it to his clinic. Um, so we are currently in the process of setting up the contracts, but it's looking very, very likely that this study will happen in Toronto, Canada. And we cannot wait. We actually had made all the sensors for the study, which was a tremendous effort, both financially and time-wise. And I think it was three or four days before the first subject was enrolled, campus shut down from COVID. So thank you, people who don't wear masks. I really appreciate your time. Um, the last thing I wanted to show you, because I'm so proud of this, is what um, Dat and Micah did. And this is what we're going to spin out into a company for trauma. What he did, he created something called PALS, which is the pH and lactate sensor. I really, I love the name. If you knew Mike and, Micah and Dad, you'd really appreciate the PALS. They're just great people. And there's kind of a rendering here of a thing you'd wear on the skin. This is a research version, not a commercial version. Inside of it is a little photo diode. And just like everything I just showed you, we have these two optodes, we call them, for lactate and um, oxygen. But... They invented something that is not actually this big for illustration purposes, measures pH, and it measures it spectroscopically, which I'm so proud of Dat and Micah for getting this to work. Um, what it basically is, is just like before, it's a flexible circuit. And this time, oh, this is not the video. Shoot, oh well, pretend like this is a video. Uh, one at a time, you can turn on this LED and this LED to measure lactate. And then this detector that looks green and the LEDs flanking it together measure pH in a really neat way. Um, so if you zoom in, this detector has a little green filter on top of it. And then on top of this triplet of rather trio of elements, we put this green schmutz. We call the HSS. Uh, I think it stands for pH sensing sheet. I kind of forgot. Uh, that's the HSS, and here you can see the lactate and oxygen. And this sucker works surprisingly well. But what I mean by surprisingly is 
Um, Dap told me it would work a lot better than I thought it could, and he was right. And so basically, when you zoom in, we have a violet colored and a blue colored light emitting diode. We have a photo sensor, and this little green thingy here is a film wrapped around the system. And I don't mean to get too esoteric with this, so forgive me, but I just want to show off in a couple slides what he did. Dad, uh, Dad found in the literature a fluorescent dye that people use a spectrometer for, this big instrument, okay, to measure pH. And what he did was he immobilized it on little tiny beads. These things are, you know, half a millimeter or smaller. And he put those beads on top of a piece of plumber's tape and wrapped it up in some goo, some biocompliant glue, and created this yellow sheet. So his idea was instead of having a big old spectrometer that you have to wear as a backpack, why don't we um, do the following? Okay, so when you use an expensive instrument with this dye, you hit it with violet colored light, okay, and you'd measure the green light that the dye emits. I kind of have a little green spectrum with a purple outline indicating that's how the dye gives off light when I hit it with purple light. Then you hit the dye with blue light and your very expensive huge machine would say, hey, we see a little more green light coming off the dye. You take the ratio under those curves or you take the ratio of the peak values and this paper was getting two or three significant figures or actually decimal places on their value of pH. It's remarkable. So what Dat did, he said, we're gonna throw away this huge instrument and I'm gonna make the same thing work with a 25 cent photodiode Right? And which she covers, and I kid you not, this green stuff is a gel, it's called a gel filter. They sell it for camera lenses. He melts it with a soldering iron. He deposits, deposits this thing on top of the photodiode, and now it acts as a filter that exactly overlaps these green spectra. Who cares, right? It might take me a while to, to explain this fully, and I'm happy to, but in a nutshell, we can turn on the purple light, measure a voltage, turn on the blue light, measure a voltage, where they're both, or all three are surrounded by this film, and he's measuring pH to the second decimal place. So, you know, 7.4 versus 7.41, he can tell with high fidelity. We started doing implant studies, this is in bunnies, um, and we can see we're tracking lactate pretty well, right? And um, pH is looking great. Towards the end of the study, we saw that the, the red dot, which is a commercial reference, blood reference pH, was different from ours. So we hit the literature really hard and found out that their system doesn't work well at these pH values. So if, wanted to, if, any, if there's any geeks out there who want to talk to me about sensor stuff, I'm happy to talk to you about it. Um, I don't know if any of this can make sense in such a short time period, so I apologize if I'm going too quickly, but I just wanted to kind of give you a sense of how we develop technologies, and these slides capture it. Um, so what I want to end with is, what are we doing right now? Okay. And we were, we're working nonstop. What we're doing right now is we want to lock down iGlobe. This needs to exist in probably a year and a half, so we can get ready for the clinical study. And I'm telling you, these students are working nonstop. So Tony is getting ketones to work on one pad. Tia and Brian are working on the chemistry to get insulin sensing work to work. The three of them meet so often and exchange ideas because some of our electronics developments require their chemistry developments. And then we ask them to help us with some of our own chemical issues. It's a beautiful collaboration. And I can tell you that they eat, leave, uh, live, breathe, drink, and everything else, I globe. And I just wanna tell you the community that we are working as hard as we possibly can to get this to work for you. And I wanna show you how this will end, positively I hope, is we're gonna do a study with David O'Neill. Maybe some of you know David. Uh, he's a thought leader in in uh, closing the loop. He's also a wonderful human being, which to me is, is very important. So as a first study with David, our sensors will be implanted either on the day of the study or one, two, or three days before. This will give us some indication of the effect of the foreign body response, but only after three days. Right? 
the subjects come in, the first cohort are healthy participants, more specifically, more specifically, they do not have diabetes. I mean, I'm sure they could have other problems. In this case, they drink, right? They give them a drink that dries up their, uh, their ketones. Then we give them um, a high gly gly glycemic index meal. And then our sensor will be able to, will be able to show us insulin changing, glucose changing, and ketone changing because David designed this experiment. And what I like about his design is they're going to change out of phase. So the ketone will go up first, and then the glucose will go up, and then the insulin. So it gives us a nice, it gives us a nice opportunity to validate the technology. Study two, you know, is the real deal here. So in this case, participants will have type one diabetes. They have to show some number of months of being stable on an insulin pump, and these are all CGM um, users. Again, this sensor eye globe will be inserted either minus three, minus two, minus one, or on the day of a study. Eight o'clock in the morning, um, they turn off the pump. And David very closely monitors ketones. Okay? Once ketones arise above 2.0 millimolar, the frequency at which the nurse draws blood for analysis will increase from every 20 minutes to every 15 minutes. If any of these occur, glucose above 22, pH less than 7, 3, 5, ketones above 5, they're going to intervene immediately uh, with IV insulin dextrose rescue. So David knows how to do this as well as anybody in the world. And then we'll have uh, the insulin pump theory kick, therapy kick back in, and we'll continue to monitor the subject. And Joanne, let me pause there and get the temperature of the room. <laughs> Do you want me to talk about the infusion set or should we go to the q &A? Um Yeah, absolutely talk about it. We're, we're, we're pulling questions, so don't worry about that. Um, and don't worry about the chat. We're, we got that covered. You okay. just keep talking, do your thing. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm an academic. Give me five minutes and I'll, I'll give you half an hour. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I uh, do want to talk about this last project, which is also uh, really important to me and quite exciting. And this was, this happened in a funny way. Uh, so Ali Maraz is a professor in, it's actually it's chemical and biomolecular engineering and, and material sciences at, at UC Irvine. And he developed this material for batteries. And what it is, it's kind of like a sponge and it has some neat properties. One is when you enter the sponge, none of the pores will ever close down. Right? And so every, you're never stuck in a dead end. There's always a way out of the sponge, so to speak. So imagine you're like in this cavern. The other neat property is the curvature of all the paths through the sponge are the same. Okay, that's a really interesting property. And, um, the other property, which is more interesting than anything else, because I like to climb mountains, is you're always at a saddle point. So no matter where you are in this material, you know, if you look left and right, then the universe drops away from you. And if you look behind and forward, it kind of climbs around. So who cares, right? Um, it was made out of metal. And I thought to myself, my goodness, uh, back in the 90s, James Brocker and Buddy Ratner, you know, two of the really big pioneers in biomaterials, they had shown that if you take a slab of material, it could be almost any material, and you have kind of hemispherical shapes at the surface or spherical pores, that blood vessels tend to want to come close to the surface. And the fibrotic capsule, like the scar type tissue, tends to move, either disappear or become a lot thinner. So I went to Ali, I said, can you tune this to 35 microns, his pore size? Because that was the magic number that um, Buddy Ratner had discovered. 35 micron radi uh, radius of curvature or diameter. Actually, I forgot. Anyway, I said, can you make it out of something soft? He goes, that's how I make it. I make it out of something called a hydrogel, which is a squishy thing. And then I coat it with metal. I said, my goodness, we've got to try this as an implant. So we got a seed grant from the JDRF. 
and it worked amazingly well. In fact, you can hardly see where the material ends and the tissue begins, and we saw blood vessels enter this material very deep, hundreds of microns in, and pretty good-sized blood vessels. You know, these are 35, 40 micron diameter blood vessels. So we kind of said, let's try this. Right? So we have the tradi traditional on the side port cannula. What if we could put this material, the sponge-like material, into the infusion set and have it stick out? Okay. And if we zoomed in, you, his material looks like a neat swirl. It's kind of a cool looking material. And if we zoom in again, we can get blood vessels. So our theory is that we'll have excellent flow re redistribution because this, it's a sponge. Reduced form body response based on the theory and our early mouse studies. Deep vascularization. We definitely saw these things after even two weeks becoming highly vascularized. And we never planned it. This thing resists kinking. It was not part of our design, but it happened to occur. So this is how we make it. This material is called a bi-gel templated material. I would need 20, 30 minutes to explain to you why it's called that, but let's just call it a BTM. And here you can see a big, long BTM. That's just about 500 microns in diameter. And here's one sticking out of an infusion set. I believe this is the Medtronic infusion set. I mean, all right. And this bag of worms is actually the material, material coming out of it. And when you zoom in, the material is absolutely gorgeous. What I do want to, what's interesting to mention is these properties of dead ends never occurring, curvatures being constant. These occur spontaneously thermodynamically. So you don't have to manufacture this material. You just, they literally put it into the microwave and this material forms. It's amazing. There's a couple more steps, but that's more or less true. So here's an image of, in blue, the material autofluoresces. You can kind of see it in blue. This is a slice through the tissue after being implanted. I think this is four week time point. So the tissue boundary is right here. And what we're seeing are very large blood vessels. These ghosts looking things, these are red blood cells. The green trace you can kind of see there's a green trace around the blood vessel that indicates the body has decided this blood vessel is mature it's there to stay okay like when you when you cut yourself you get very red because the blood the body builds a bunch of new blood vessels so the construction crew can come in and build new tissue but then most of those blood vessels get taken away which is why it's no longer red but these blood vessels are quote unquote permanent we see them as far as 500 microns deep. This thing is incredibly well vascularized. And we looked at the immune system. Boy, this is really hard to explain in one slide, but the red dots are the macrophages in a phenotype. So they've taken on a, a, a state of being, so to speak, that secretes molecules that tells the body, you know, don't attack. The body still does attack, attack a little bit. It's happening slowly. But they just, they're telling the body, just chill out. And while, while you're chilling out, you know, let's get some blood vessels in here. So that's what the histology shows us. And this was something we just didn't expect. And when you stuff an infusion set with this material, you can't kink it. So here's a silhouette bent around a peg. You can see it kinking. This is doing the same thing. It's, it's a little bit out of focus, but there's a peg there. And we can bend it like this, and the sponge prevents it from kinking. We're ending this, this I think is my last slide. So we're ending this project with a, um, a collaboration with Jeffrey Joseph at Thomas Jefferson University. Right? He came up with Animus, the Animus Bump uh, years ago. He's great. Jeff is an amazing person. And so we're building this currently. We have the infusion set. That's based on this material. I can't wait to show you what the infusion set looks like, but we haven't filed the patents yet. It's amazing. So a sharp needle is going to carry this into the body. The needle gets pulled out, just like you're doing now, and it leaves the little uh, oops. It leaves the BTM sticking out of an infusion set. We're good to go. So the study we're doing is going to investigate how well does how well does this technology work over 14 days. So there's a diabetic pig model, and we're basically going to randomly 
have the Medtronic infusion set, the Silhouette, or our infusion set, we call it, we, we call it FlexFlow, one of the two will be in charge of maintaining glycemia for the first period, and then in the second period of time, the other two take over. And we're going to do what's called a PKPD study. We're going to ask, are the kinetics between blood insulin changing okay, and the rate of deliver, delivery, delivery by the pump, okay, is, it, is insulin appearing in the blood more quickly or less quickly or the same between our technology or the Medtronic technology? And we're going to ask the question, is there a benefit to the control of blood glucose with our technology as compared to the silhouette? And on that note, I will stop talking and would love to hear your questions. So many. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> and I know um, Henrik is, is scribbling away a question as well as Rebecca, okay. and I've been putting them in chat. Um, I'm going to turn this over to um, Henrik, and he's going to volley with Rebecca, and we're, we're just we're, we're going to give you some tough questions. No, no, no okay. pressure. Uh, uh, I'm not, I don't feel pressure at all. <laughs> just drive. <laughs> May I start? Absolutely. Sure. Okay, super awesome presentation, super exciting to see all these details and kind of like, oh, I learned so much during your presentation, it's just crazy. Uh, so my first question is, so today the CGMs that we have in our bodies, uh, so they are coated with some enzyme that reacts with glucose and produce some current. Is that how it works, kind of? Yeah, um, how much detail, so. On the high level. Okay, <laughs> yes, so in, in the case of Dexcom, there's an enzyme on it, it produces peroxide. They measure peroxide. Uh, the Abbott actually wires that enzyme directly into a circuit. So it's looking at electrons being created essentially. Ah, okay. In so in, in this case, measuring glucose, if I don't understand it wrong, all of the pads you're using are using light. Um, the ones I told you about, <laughs> yes. Oh, okay, so glucose, <laughs> glucose is kind of like the same technology or is it? It's so, so we call it an optode. I got my PhD in David Goff's lab at UC San Diego, right? He, he came up with the Glysense technology. I love Dave. And he uses electro, electrochemistry, electrodes. And some, one of the many things he taught me is that I hate electrodes. So um, <laughs> we, I, I, I put a lot of thinking into how can we not use elect, electrodes. And just as Dexcom uses Oxygen, a peroxide generation measured electric, uh, with electrodes, we use oxygen consumption, which all the glucose, all the CGMs consume oxygen. Right? So we, we use oxygen consumption because there's a very good dye for telling us how much oxygen there is, and it's really reliable and a repeatable measurement. And if there's any electrode people on the call, there's no warm up time, which is just a very scary thing to me about electrodes. Oh my God, you just answered one of my questions. <laughs> it's, I'm it's not sure you did. <laughs> yeah, the reliability in the beginning when you inject a, a new sensor, uh, it's quite flaky frequently. And you know, those are the practical questions, like those ones. I would love to hear your, your guesses on those. So I don't wanna make any claims until we've done a human study. So I, I tend to be very conservative in, in what I claim. So what we see in a, when this is in a, a subject, it takes sometimes 10 minutes to 15 minutes to warm up because there's two things happening. The sensor is online immediately, but the body is also reacting, right? You can't remove the part of the body. And I'm sure, I suspect Dexcom is dealing with the same thing. So the, the body reacts acutely and then it reacts chronically. And I don't know to what extent you can ever really uh, come up with a workaround on, on that problem. I forgot your original question, so I'm not gonna answer it. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> the original question was the, the warm up time. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Reliability the first 24 hours, yeah. So the sensor is shockingly reliable. It's warm up time is short. We now have, a, we have one lactate sensor that has been running for a month and it's holding calibration. Wow. But once you put the body into the, into the equation, I don't wanna make the same kind of claim. 
But we put we we had a six month push start when this grant started back in January, or we in fact this is the way the grant is written. The first thing we're gonna do is lock down our films. In our mind, that was the biggest project risk. As as anyone who who works in sensors may agree with me, the keeping the enzyme stable and the chemistry stable in solution when when the enzymes are you know, an enzyme has a waste product, so to speak, right? It produces peroxide. Uh, you may have leaching of materials. There's a lot that can go wrong when you go from the bench top into a clinical device. And we decided to put all of our energy into that film. And I'm really happy to report to you that it, it, it was a good effort. So we have a question from our YouTube uh, audience. They're, they're wondering what the sizes of these devices, that the, the actual part that sits on your skin, I think, um, are right now. Um, can you compare them to a coin or something in our current world so we have some idea of what we're looking at? Yes, um, our goal is about the size of a US quarter. That's flexible. So part of the project we're operating on now is to make it into that. There's nothing technologically in the way of making it that small. It's just a matter of the effort. A question about just a follow up on that. Um, what kind of adhesive, or what are you expecting that will come from that that will be okay for most users? Right. Um, I I don't know if anyone has. I don't know if ten, if the ten people I ask will have the same answer as to which adhesive they like. But we are in contact with 3M. I don't know if you're aware of this, but here in Orange County, every year is the medical device. MD and M West Medical Device and Manufacturing Expo, where the Anaheim Convention Center is filled with everything you can imagine as related to making a device. And adhesives are all over this conference. So Luciano, uh, Joanne, you know Luciano from the group, he is now on a mission to find the best adhesive. So I don't have a clear answer for you, but it is very much on our mind. And at some point you mentioned an 18 gauge needle for the insertion. Is that still the case? That seems awfully large compared to what we yeah. usually work with. Yeah, actually, I think for the next generation, I want to use one of those stakes, like for a tent. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> the, the, the current version is the actual device is 330 microns wide. So that's about a third of a millimeter. The custom made needle is, it's hard to, so we all think of needles as round, but we make something flat, but it's about the size of a 26 gauge needle. Yeah. Sounds much better than 18. Oh yeah, the 18 gauge, we just wanted to get a, a clinical study done and uh, we didn't have the resources to make it small back then. Yeah, <laughs> I like people too much. You know, there's a few people I know, I might give them the 18 gauge version. <laughs> <laughs> That was a joke. Do we have any more questions in the chat? <laughs> Rebecca, do you see any good ones? Uh, yeah, I have a question about the, the inserter because I've done a lot of uh, focus groups on inserters. Um, and the last one I did was with CapBio and they had not shown their inserter to females. And so they had a, a sense of how it, that it should have been squeezed. And we went in there instead of putting our fingers down, we had to go around and they realized because women tend to have longer nails and they had never uh. thought about that. Um, so I'm just curious about th that insertion device is kind of scary looking, but it, maybe it's because it's black. Um, but how is that being tested? Um, and can um, yeah. people in Loop and Learn participate in being, do some of the focus groups? That's a double question, sorry. No, it's okay. I'm going to ask them. I want to answer them in reverse order. I'm extremely interested to hear your thoughts on what the inserter, inserter should look like. Right? I mean, you can imagine how focused we are right now on getting the thing to work, which is tremendously challenging. Um, for this funded project, we're going to use this inserter because we know it works. When this gets commercialized, this will be a museum piece, right? <laughs> we, we, the, 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 this, right? I'll have this in, a, in like my, you know, little curio bookshelf, Joanne. We have, we're going to work with design engineers, 
do focus groups, et cetera, et cetera, when it comes time to make a commercial version. And I am all ears. I never would have thought of the fingernail problem. That's well, not they fascinating. Didn't either. They were, all the men were sitting around the table and I brought in three people for the, for the review of how it worked. And they said, why are you doing that? Well, I would like to mention that we are a diverse group. <laughs> If you are. That wasn't um, a passive aggressive yeah. comment. You're just a diverse group. <laughs> I have one more question. I have one more question and then I'll throw it back to you guys. Um, when you put the material in that with, that gets vascularized, I remember when the, the doctoral student presented this, the question was, what happens when you pull it out? Uh, is there going to be a gusher? Um, this thing is so small. Uh, have you ever been to Old Faithful? So you, when you walk on the boardwalk to see it, those little tiny geysers that are hitting the bottom of the boardwalk, we're going to be like one of those. <laughs> we're, we're like, oh, Joanne, I have no idea. I, it's, this thing is so tiny. I just don't know until we start doing it in people. But I don't expect it to be a problem. Okay. These are micro vessels. The other question related to that one was, does the sponge actually come out or does that get left in the skin? Um, I'm so sorry to answer it this way, but I can't tell you because we haven't <laughs> filed. I, all I, can, I, will, I will say this, we've given this um, a lot of thought and have done a lot of testing and came up with an interesting solution. I apologize, I can't tell you what it is now um, because if I do, we can't protect it intellectually. We can never give it to somebody. We understand that. We, yeah. We're just curious. <laughs> it's a, no, no, actually, it's a perfect example of the questions I need to hear. Please keep them, keep in, even if you think of a question, you know, besides, is this guy getting my tax dollars? If you think of another question, um, <laughs> don't hesitate to reach out to me. We always like to learn. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Earlier, you talked about it being a diverse group and, and wanting all the people in your clinical trials. How are you ensuring that you get people of different levels of insulin resistance in those trials? We're not. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's, we, I would like to, but this is a somewhat limited study. And the outcome, it has to do with the outcome variables. So the outcome variable of this study is, can we track these analytes? in a carefully controlled setting. Um, so you're asking a beautiful pharmacodynamics question, and that will require a much bigger study with a, probably an FDA cleared or at least an IDE device. But I have given that tremendous thought. And I, I do want to, to answer your question as well with something that we think might help people, which is if you're measuring insulin continuously, and you're measuring glucose continuously, you're actually learning re in real time about the insulin sensitivity. And we're hoping that can inform a more intelligent dose. But someone you know much smarter than I am can, will have to figure out those mathematics. But yeah, it's a good question. I haven't accounted for it. I, I have a, I, so um, my daughter is 11. She's mm -hmm. going into puberty. Uh, from what I understand, that's one of the most challenging times as a type one is she's a girl. She has that week per month. She's also going through puberty. She has the growth hormones kicking in, you know, about two hours after falling asleep, which are extremely unpredictable. unpredictable. Some nights it's crazy, some nights it's not. Uh, I, I don't have the answer on this question. Was there anything you <laughs> like? All these different, uh, you know, hormones and measuring insulin, you know, measuring lactate, all those things. Like, it would be so amazing if you could provide me with a prediction of what's going to happen the, the coming hours. That makes sense. Uh, so you know how the, the the looping system, you know, can pump in things because it's those those are quite challenging things. And I think many parents with me would love to have something that handled that better. Oh. I mean, I appreciate the question. Um, currently, I, I don't, I cannot imagine how measuring glucose, insulin, et cetera, can account for something like a hormone change. But you are bringing up something that's very important to me. Uh, um, measuring insulin 
One of the things that we will achieve is measuring a peptide or a small protein circulating in the body continuously. That actually has never been done before. And it's extremely challenging. But once Greg and I kind of crack the nut, we can think of ways to try to sense other small molecules and small signaling molecules. So we've discussed at length, you know, what should we measure? So as a future project, something like cortisol, I never thought about growth hormone. It's a great idea. We would actually, I would love to learn from your community. You know, we do read the literature as well, but it's, it's nothing like hearing from a parent or, or someone with, with type 1 diabetes what's important. And we, we need to understand that as well. And I don't want to get too preachy, but um, I'll, I'll give, if you can give me two minutes. Right, so I'm pushing 50, and I want to know what I do when I retire. Right, I, I need, I want one last thing I do. Right, you know, a nice decade of something, and this is what it is. I want to create a center for making pediatric medical devices. Go, the center takes a product through FDA commercialization, et cetera, et cetera, but is nonprofit. Because I can tell you, trying to raise money for a, a pediatric device that we invented is next to impossible. And this thing had to do with ear infection diagnosis. And when we meet with investors, they're so passionate about it, those who have kids. But once they learn the market is not a billion dollars a year, people lose interest quickly. Um, and I think the examples you're bringing up exactly falls into that category. Right? Someone needs to pick up the mantle and make continuous devices for something that may be considered niche, but I think we have the opportunity to provide them. Sorry, I'm giving you a very long answer, but this is something very near and dear to my heart. So if any of you feel like, I wish I could measure X, Y, or Z, contact me directly or, or through Joanne, I wanna hear it. We'd be glad to put it out as a, as a question. Give me a few of that questions. We, we put polls out pretty frequently and people like that because they get to hear what the questions are and then they get to answer them and participate. Um, I, I have a question that follows on to what you're talking about is once you have your sensor and you've got the four and then you add the fifth item and the sixth, does it get simpler as you add different things that you will be measuring? Can you throw 20 things on that you will measure on a strip? Well, I wish I remember, Joanne, I wish I remembered the computation, but for a Department of Defense grant, I think we put 21 pads on it. Okay. And the device just didn't change size very much. What you, we can make it a little, so if you looked at an edge on, there's kind of width and there's thickness. Mm -hmm. So every time we add a little bit of thickness, we can add, I guess it's three or four more pads. So the final device for 20 just did not appreciably change the size of the device. Wow. So talk to me about pH, please. Sure. Uh, for someone with type 1 diabetes, uh, how is that important and how would that change the way we treat ourselves if we have that measure? You know, frankly, if you have ketone, I don't know if pH will be useful to you. Um, we did it in the context of emergency medicine. There's a number of different types of trauma where lactate and pH, how, depending on how they change, can, can help you stratify different um, uh, conditions. I am not an expert in this, and I just don't know if you need pH if you had the ketone, Joanne. I'm not sure. The blood is very good at buffering. My first reaction to that was, why wouldn't we need pH? Because that's really useful in monitoring your kidneys, um, which is something that we're always interested in. Oh. <laughs> Well, the good news is I actually can put my money, I can put someone else's money where my mouth is, I guess. Uh, adding, really adding pH to this. Um, okay. Once we get insulin to work on this strip, we'll learn everything we need to know to get pH to work almost immediately at this, at this scale. So if it has value, adding it is actually not that hard at this point. So I'm going to type in my little notes. I promise you I'm not checking my email. I'm just typing notes. <laughs> okay. so a question from the chat here. Uh, is there an estimated amount of time these sensors will last? And I guess it's going to be a question about the various kind of sensors too. Like, will they all last a certain time? Like insulin, glucose, lactate, or how? Right now we have 10 days for the Dexcom. Right. So... Thank you. I'm glad you asked that question. There, there's two failure modes, right? 
One is the form body response, where the body just simply rejects the device. It, it removes the blood vessels, it, it walls it off with uh, fibrotic, fibrotic tissue, and that's a materials question, and it has to do with the mechanical properties. So we're very flexible with this material. We're coating it with, you know, the name brand, so to speak, uh, bio biocompatible materials. So we think we're doing about the best what we're going to do. Now, when you ask about the sensor, now that we have this really long acting film, there's nothing else in our strategy that should wear down within two weeks. Everything in it is, everything else is, so the enzymes are proteins and, you know, they're susceptible to things uh, such as, you know, they can be cleaved, they can be broken, uh, the peroxide from the enzyme can, can break things down. But the other chemistries just don't have that kind of susceptibility to them. It's a very good question. Thank you. And how sure. often do those sensors get readings? Like we, we've gotten used to the five minutes of Dexcom. Do you, do you have a comparable reading number? <laughs> well, when it's plugged in and not wireless, it's every 12 seconds. Um, when we go wireless, it just has to be intermittent because of battery power. Right. Does that, does that uh, answer your question? Okay. So that is the answer to the other two, to the Dexcom and Libra and those things. It's basically a battery question, how frequently they... That's, that's my guess. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Interesting. Well, the part that sits over where the sensor is, um, if you've looked at the Eversense, haven't you, and, and the way they have a, a piece that sits on there, but it's, you remove it every day, you charge it every day, and you change the film that attaches it. Does yours need to be hardwired attached? No, no, no. We, that's just for the research units. The, the reason why, why we're not wireless is we just haven't put the effort into it yet, Joanne. It's mm -hmm. going wireless is surprisingly trivial. I, I was actually really surprised at how, how easy it is to go wireless. Um, the micro, many microcontrollers that people use for a small flexible chip like this, a lot of them have Bluetooth built in. So it's just a matter of programming. Um, the idea of having an external charger at night is not a bad idea. That's ultimately, ultimately the decision a company would make. But by our estimates, um, you know, intermittent measurements every few minutes, we should get at least two weeks of battery life on this. Okay, who's ready to sign up? <laughs> I, I have two more questions. Yeah, um, please. The dashboard looked amazing. Can I assume that somewhere someone's also programming a website where we can see our history and compare things over time? Uh, I would ask this. I don't know if you know Joanne Milo, but she might have a really good answer to that question. <laughs> I, I, I do. <laughs> Well, if it feeds data into Night Scout, there you are, we're, we're, we're golden. Um, I would assume there'd be a, a user interface, um, but, but that's not probably what you would do, Elliot, but whoever adapts this to what they're doing. I'm curious whether um, this would be also used on patch pumps or um, pods. Mm. Yeah. I, that's way, that's, Joanne, that's way above my pay grade, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there's one more question that just jumped in. Do I have any more? Okay. I, I have more questions. Okay, sure. you got it. Go for it. <laughs> so so um, a common problem uh, that I think most people using pumps experience is the absorption can be very different from pump to pump. You know, you can have like, you have when you're using loop you can set overrides essentially saying like how much insulin you need i guess uh and one you can run with one pump and run like at 100 percent and then they last for three days you switch to a new one and it's like 120 percent to get the same results now of course that could be external factors but to me it's quite obvious that it's absorption in some way or another so when you're measuring the insulin with your sensor this would be one of the things that I suspect you would be able to measure, which would be, to me, a huge deal. Right. I mean, whether or not the insulin actually made it into your body. Exactly. Yeah. That, that, is, that was the original um, goal, goal of this. In fact, we, we applied for an NIH grant on this exact topic, and the reviewer basically, I talked about dead in bed, for example. 
And the reviewer responded, insulin pumps work. There's no problem. So, I don't have to tell you. <laughs> uh, you, sir, do not have diabetes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, this, anyway, kidding, kidding, and there was a, kidding aside, this is exactly how we got motivated to build this in the first place. Is a friend of mine nearly died from that dead in bed situation. And that kind of inspired the idea of why don't we try to measure insulin continuously? That would be huge, I think. <clears throat> well, I think we, we deal with so many failures, uh, yeah. pods particularly, but um, sites, they just fail. Um, you know, the infusion, where it fails, it fails. And you don't know it until you're in trouble. So yeah, that would be amazing. Um, do you have, more, you have more questions, Henry? Oh, I have more, yes, of course. Um, <laughs> so uh, compression loads is one or all uh, favorites. Uh, once in a while, especially during night, you are laying down on the sensor and it's, uh, I don't know exactly what's happening. I heard that the, the, the cells are moving away or something like that from the, mm. from the wire. I don't know exactly what's causing it, but I do know that it's a problem. Uh, and would this make any difference in any way, you know, reducing the compression loads? That would also be an amazing thing. Do you mean compression loss in the sensing? You're talking about insulin delivery. No, it's so when That's you're laying down on the Dexcom or the, oh, the, the Dexcom. during the night, exactly, you should put pressure on it. Like kind of like I think it's usually when when the body kind of like goes numb. You know, if you're laying on your arm and you have your Dexcom on your arm, then it starts giving you false lows. Like it can drop from five millimole per liter down to like two and a half. Usually you see it because you go straight and then it dies straight down and then it comes back up when you move your child or if you move yourself. So that would be an amazing thing to also reduce. Yeah, um, it's, I, I see a comment, I don't have my glasses on, is it Marion? Uh, I, I can't read it. Yes, it's Marion. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So I should put my glasses on, it makes me look smarter. Yeah, so um, you see. <laughs> No, the, it's a tough question. I, our sensor, we could probably make it so the sensor can tell you that you're, it's being compressed, but I don't know if you want to be woken up by that information. So, so hello. Hi. So, <laughs> right if, now we are getting woken up by that information with a low glucose alarm. Okay, well then maybe, <laughs> it, it, it's, okay. It's kind of like an earthquake alarm that goes off one second you know, before the earthquake. But when you, what happens is, this is an educated guess, all right? Is that when you shut down, when you put pressure, you're shutting down the circulation, you're also preventing drainage in, into the lymph. So you kind of get a stagnant volume of water, interstitial fluid. You're not getting circulation from the, from the macular vasculature. So there's no, um, you're not in equilibrium with the blood and the enzymes are still consuming glucose. So now, you, now it's like lighting a candle in a sealed oxygen container, right? You, you're consuming glucose, more glucose can't diffuse in because you've shut down the microcirculation. This is me guessing as an engineer, it wouldn't surprise me if the sensor is working exactly as it was built, but it's consuming the local glucose, so it's reading a number that's low compared to the blood. Is That's a scientific guess. I don't know what I'm talking about. I want to be perfectly clear. <laughs> Okay. It, is, it actually is a significant problem. I was chatting online with Henrik and he goes, excuse me, I have to go check my, my daughter. She's having a compression low. Kenny Fox yeah. is in our thing says, oh no, Tessa had a compression low. I uh, hear it a lot. Yeah. yeah. That sounds awful. Yeah. It's annoying for sure. I'm glad you told me about it. Um, so make, uh, make a note. And here comes the next question. <laughs> I'm waiting for more questions in the chat, meanwhile. Okay. So, um, so a common uh, knowledge in, in the, in the uh, social media channels is that someone has having bad readings on their Dexcom or Libre and people answer, are you dehydrated? So people start drinking water and it seems to solve the problem. I'm on the same train. I, I'm, I'm asking my daughter to drink more water. Uh, what, is that true? And also, would that also be possible to measure? So you can say like, hey, you need to drink more water, otherwise your sensor is not gonna be optimal. Yeah. Um, 
<clears throat> to answer the two questions, the first one, I, I honestly don't know. It wouldn't surprise me if you get a salt, salt imbalance or something happens if you don't have enough fluid in your body that might make the tissue change. I can't imagine their actual sensor is changing. I think what I would guess is the equilibrium between the local tissue and the blood that's changing. And that, that might be the reason, but this pure speculation. Uh, to the other question, so the Department of Defense has actually asked us on several occasions to make a hydration sensor. So it is something that we're thinking about. Uh, it's shockingly hard to measure hydration. In fact, it's not even trivial to define it, as it turns out. So one of the ways we're thinking of doing it is to measure to create a sodium sensor. So if we can measure the sodium in the interstitium, that might be a pretty good way of getting a sense of the hydration. And if I can go back to what I said five minutes ago, diabetes and sepidus, right, is a is a problem in children and the endocrinologist at the local children's hospital actually asked if we could make a sodium sensor that's continuous. And there's no market for it, so no one's made it, but it turns out it's quite doable. So we're planning on, on doing it. And that's, that's the kind of thing I would like to just to sell people for no profit. But um, that's a long answer to your question. I think maybe sodium might be a surrogate for hydration, but no, we have not built something yet that measures hydration. It's a very good idea. Anyone with type one who does develop any kind of kidney involvement, um, what they always hear is, are you hydrated? And you say yes, and they say, well, do it more. And so the question becomes, how do you know I'm not doing it more? Is Maybe that's not the answer. So if there were a way to measure that, and I don't know if it's sodium, but uh, you know, I'll check with my nephrologist and say, how, does he, how do you know when you're hydrated? Yeah, that I would, would love to hear their. I would love to hear their answer. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's actually very. So, I'm a long distance runner. Uh, I've done a couple of fifty miles races, etc., over mm -hmm. mountains. And one big challenge is actually dehydration and salt balance in your body. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can piggyback on all the people that want to buy these devices. <laughs> uh, you know, when it comes to funding. Uh, because as you say, you want a big market. And if you can combine those two, maybe you have an opportunity there. Yeah, I completely agree with you. In fact, I think LifeStrip, I mean, this, this is one example of my big vision is sensing is just one example of it, but it's right. So we could, this can be monetized through, for example, the trauma, emergency medicine, emergency transport market, then to, to put on something, sorry for the word, more niche, actually can make sense because now the bigger market can fund the smaller one and we can save people's lives. So, so I, I, your thinking is very much in line with our thinking. It's a good idea. I, I think this is so small. We're also hoping to help exercise nuts. I don't know what most people will do with the data, but they might love to know what their lactate is. <laughs> Bragging I'm rights or something. Wishing. I'm sitting here wishing there was an easy way to like pick and choose all the sensors I particularly want and have it made just for me. But I, I don't think that's going to be that easy. <laughs> well, we're, we're that'll quite, cost you money. <laughs> yeah. Well, you never know. I would love to hear your thoughts though, because it might turn out that it's you and 30 other million people. It could just be you and a hundred other people and very important. Right. At this moment, I need all of the ones shown because that's everything my endocrinologist and I keep tracking and saying this is important. <laughs> all right. We don't know what's not working yet, but something's wrong in all of those. <laughs> well, I hope you hope I hope you figure it out. Me too. <laughs> I, I just I gosh I, I think we could keep going, but um it's it's Sunday night. You have a you have a fun thing to fun tomorrow. So, um thank you, Elliot. Um, knew this would be interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Henrik and Rebecca. Great help. And yeah, but. Really appreciate it. We'll talk more and maybe we'll, we'll poll our community to give you some feedback um, just as if you don't have enough. I, and this is, I love it. If, if any of you are local or, be, you know, or happen in the area, shoot me a line. You can come visit us, meet the team, tell us what we're doing wrong, which is incredibly valuable to us. Um, you might want to tell us what we're doing right because, you know, it's good for our spirit. <laughs> Uh, and uh, thank you for your time. This actually is quite flattering to me that you would listen to this. And I feel quite lucky in my job that there's a group of people that were actually acutely trying to help. And um, every, you know, I'm, I guess I'm a left brain, half brain type of person that I'm actually an emotional creature. So um, 
this kind of feedback is very important to me. And even if it's terrible feedback, please give it to me. Okay, I'm, I'm all ears. We, we love your passion and thank awesome. you for doing what you do. All right, everybody, have a great week. Um, good night, Elliot and everybody. Thanks. Bye. 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 Have a nice night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.